Hello, this is Scarlet and Rage podcast. Uh, we are coming to you with our weekly Big Ten or National Outlook episode. Uh, we did the Buckeye episode earlier this week. If you haven't had a chance to listen to that, I'd encourage you to go back because there's some things that uh, are applicable uh, even past the game. Some of the discussion we have about position groups and how they're performing, et cetera, et cetera. I think you would enjoy it. If you do go back to it, maybe fast forward about 10 to 12 minutes in if you're cranky about Cincinnati Reds material uh, because we did uh, discuss the Reds for a bit on the front end of that podcast. Uh, so some of these off-topic things that we discuss, if you don't like them, just rewind. And I will try to start putting in the notes, the order of the show. Uh, I don't know how exact it's going to be, whether I'm going to put timestamps at this point, but I'll at least put the order of the show uh, and, and you can kind of fast forward along if you're not interested in the subject. But we have one of those a little bit off topic subjects today. and We're going to cover the first one. Uh, something that many people around here at Cincinnati are feeling uh, sad about. I heard a lot of comments about it. Uh, you know, a lot of people have texted me about it, and that is the passing of the all-time hit king, Pete Rose. Jay, uh, what were your thoughts uh, about Pete? What do you think about Pete in general? Let, let, let's I, start with let's start, let's start with the most simple thing about Pete, Jay. Should Pete be in the Hall of Fame? I mean, yes. I don't know that my opinion really matters, but I would say yes. He's apologized. He's gone through the ringer for it and everything. And, um, yeah, I don't really have much to say. He's the it's, hit a, it's a, it's a disgrace to baseball that they let that man die without being in the hall of fame. It's a disgrace to baseball. It really is. That's, that's my take on it. I'll just leave it at that. This isn't a Pete Rose or baseball podcast, but that's my take. Um, I, I really think that, uh, he deserved to be in. He had more hits than anybody. Uh, he made a mistake. There was never any evidence of Pete gambling on the reds, uh, to lose, and so um, and there's never any evidence he gambled when he was uh, playing before he became the player manager. Uh, but at any rate, um, uh, great guy, great character, great ambassador of baseball, great ambassador of Cincinnati uh, and the Cincinnati Reds. And it's sad to see uh, the all-time hit King go. I just um, just kind of unexpected. I, I thought he'd make it, you know, probably three, four, five more years. Um, you know, he'd been doing really good just – Eight, nine months ago, a year ago, he did an interview with Joe Buck, but life is fleeting, and uh, evidently he deteriorated quickly and, and had a heart attack or stroke or something here this past week. Yeah, it really, really sucks, man. And what really, really sucks are the people that comment on some of these internet threads just completely bashing this person who just died. It's not like he killed anybody, and they're just calling him a piece of shit and a scumbag and all this stuff, and it's just like, you know what? I'm curious what your everyday life is like, you know, do people well, like say the same about you? Well, uh, they smeared him. Uh, the media smeared him some years back with the, the, uh, pulling up a, you know, a 40 year old, um, situation of him and a young girl, which at the time was totally legal, uh, by today's standards, it would be, uh, you know, not appropriate, but it, at the time it was totally legal. Uh, you know, he had consent of the parents to date the girl, <laughs> Uh, you know, he was in her thirties and she was a teenager, but that being said, um, it was a different time and, you know, he's certainly not a perfect man, never claimed to be a perfect man, but, uh, you know, Pete is who he is. He loved baseball. Uh, and he, I don't think there was anybody in America that could talk baseball the way that Pete could. I mean, he was a player manager, so, I mean, he absolutely knew the game. He was a great player. Um, he was a part of maybe the best team of all time. Now that's the argument that that's the biggest thing I remember is that, you know, the 1976 Cincinnati Reds, you know, they, so many hall of famers on that team. Uh, I think it's them versus the Yankees from like the twenties. It's always the discussion is like, who's yeah. the best team of all time. But uh, it was, yeah, it was, man. Great, it was a great team. And I saw uh, George Foster from that team in batting cages here uh, recently and went over and talked to him and, told him that uh, I knew he'd hit 54 homers one year, and he was kind of impressed by that, uh, that I knew his stats. And uh, so a real, real nice guy. He was on that big red machine team. He's still hanging around. Um, but, uh, yeah, sad, sad to see Pete go. Um, it, you know, it, that's, a, you know, that's really it. Uh, but, you know, moving on, Jay, 
uh, unless you've got anything else to yeah, add. Yeah, man, to. I just want to say, we didn't mention this in the last episode, but more and more news is coming out about everything going on in Western North Carolina, Eastern Tennessee with all the flooding and stuff. And let's just say that our prayers are with them. Uh, it's pretty disastrous over there. And I don't know if a lot of our viewers have attended this, but I have frequented like Asheville a lot in the past couple of years. It's a really awesome place to visit. Very scenic. Uh, the breweries are great. The food is great. People are great. Cool town to visit. You know, I've heard the same about Boone and a lot of these places have just been absolutely destroyed. I don't believe the media is covering it enough, but this was just a absolute freak of nature and they still need help over there. So people that, you know, are just not really up to date on this. They definitely need help over there. College, college football also comes into play with this story. Yeah. The uh, Appalachian, Appalachian state. state is there mm -hmm. in Boone. Yeah. I've heard it's really bad. Uh, like uh, it's hard for me to imagine, but I've heard it's just like shockingly bad uh, in uh, North Carolina and in even parts of Georgia and, uh, uh, you know, other states as well. I'm kind uh, of dealing with it in a small level, nothing close to that, but a small level, Michael. Okay. A yeah. tree well, fell over in my backyard, a massive tree. Oh, from the wind? I think so, because it definitely mm. wasn't water. It didn't rain a whole lot here, but um, I can tell you that I woke up the next day. My wife had stayed home from work, and I'm like, what are you doing here for? She couldn't really drive into work that day. It was too bad, but She's like, we also have to deal with that. And then I'm like, what? And I see a bunch of branches outside my window and like this huge tree from behind our property, actually behind our neighbor's property, fell and crashed, destroyed their gate. And it's kind of still sitting there on top of our gate. And it's like taking up my entire yard. And, you know, I'm like, well, damn. But it turns out the HOA is going to handle it and take care of it and pay for it. Oh, well, so. that's fantastic. I was, yeah. I was going to say, well, the, if you've got to go to insurance, like, yeah, insurance pays for it reluctantly. They try to get everything uh, they can, uh, you know, do everything they can to. I know, think we were saved on. because it was outside of our property line. Mm. It was actually in. It was on community. the home. It was on the community ground. Oh, well, you're, you're lucky. Yeah. That, it was, that's it came from the community ground, not on our property. So really I would think that they would pay for the repairs to our gate too, if I were to guess. Yeah. Well, that'd be great. Yeah, so that would be great. If a tree is going to fall, uh, it's good for it to fall from the homeowners association's property so that they will cover everything. And you know uh, what also would be great, Michael? Mm -hmm. What? What would be great is if, and I know this is usually our Big Ten episode, but what would be really great is if we knew in our minds that mm -hmm. the Big Ten could compete and beat the SEC in football. Wouldn't yeah. that be great? That would well, just be spectacular. It, it, it would be. And just to jump way ahead on that thought, uh, you know, we're going to get into that. Obviously now football is starting. Uh, you know, I am going to Jay, let me get a pen. Cause I'm going to timestamp for the viewers every time we segue into a section. So, um, as I go and get that pen, I just want to kind of throw this out there and have you respond to it. I believe that from what we're seeing so far with the eye test that the sec is right now, the stronger overall football conference from the big 10. I, I think that I feel pretty confident that at the end of the year, that's going to be the case that the sec is just a bit stronger. However, there is a opportunity and there certainly is in play that regardless of the overall strength being greater, the big 10 could catapult once again for a second straight year to the national championship game and crown the national champion, shutting the sec out for two consecutive years that would be number one glorious because the Buckeyes would have won their third national championship this millennium and secondly it would be glorious because the SEC would be shut out for another at least 365 days from having that championship trophy on any campus I'll be right back so everyone, on top of that, I just want everyone to realize something while Michael is fetching that pen. What I want everyone to realize is it has been a little over a month into the college football season already. Time has flown so fast. It's time for us to maybe sit back and enjoy 
everything that has occurred so far and try and live in the moment more. And it's not easy. I know it. I try and take in as much college football as I possibly can every Saturday and really Friday night at this point. But it's just the season is going by so fast. We're already in October. It's like, you know, you're kind of excited and you're always looking for the next thing. But in reality, you just got to enjoy every moment. Michael, what the, the thing I just mentioned is we need to live in the moment more in this college football season, man, because the season has gone by fast. We are already a month into the season. And that is why we are doing this episode. It's really the state of college football. Who are the best teams we've seen? How do the Big Ten, how does the Big Ten stack up? against other conferences how does the big 10 let's be real how does it stack up against the sec michael thinks the big 10 can hang around the sec i on their hand i i on the other hand especially in the top five or six don't believe the big 10 really stacks up with the sec at all so it's just we need to just sit back and enjoy it so, Michael, let's start off real quick because we didn't cover this game. I mean, obviously, we're not going to cover this game during the Ohio State podcast, but let's mm. deep dive into the Georgia-Alabama game or Alabama-Georgia game that was just played this past Saturday night in Tuscaloosa. Michael, when you watch that game, you don't have to break it down, but like what comes to your mind? Like what comes to mind when you first watch that game? I know what comes to my mind. Well, uh, I mean, what came to my mind really was that, you know, these were two very good teams, two very uh, uh, fast and athletic teams. And it, you know, was just kind of a reminder of when you go out against a really good team, especially like on the road or, even sometimes the neutral environment atmospheres can be a little bit weird um, and things get rolling against you. It can go downhill quick. And Ohio state's been a part of a couple of these um, games in their, in their uh, history over the last 15 or 20 years. But Ohio state was never able to rebound any kind of momentum. Uh, and, and unless you count the Penn state game, which they got way down in that, um, but you know, this was very impressive because I thought the game would end up, I mean, I thought Georgia would come back, but I thought the game would end up about 40, 45 or 48 to, to 21. Uh, I never dreamed that Georgia would ever take the lead. And so while their offense looks very susceptible to getting bogged down, uh, they don't have any, um, you know, just top notch weapons that you would go, oh, this guy's a, a first round receiver, anything like that. I mean, at least not that is evident at this point, but clearly they showed that they do have some explosiveness that is uh, a little bit concerning. You know, I mean, to, to have an offense that can explode like that in one half against the Alabama defense, um, you know, that's certainly something that you have to take note of. And Alabama had a uh, incredible, um, offense themselves with Jalen Milrow growing some since last year, seemingly taking some steps forward, uh, being a big threat with his legs and being a very powerful runner. Not only is he very fast, he's a very powerful runner. And uh, he throws a great deep ball. He doesn't throw a great intermediate ball. So if you, if you can get pressure on him uh, and make him rush those throws, that's your best bet. Uh, but certainly a formidable offense. I'm not sure about the defenses, Jay. I don't know exactly what to think about the defenses after watching that game. Well, I when I watch that game, what initially comes to mind, and I'm not breaking the game down as much yet, but what comes to mind are two teams that just let it all hang out in the biggest of games and the biggest of moments. Alabama spreading Georgia out, using every bit of the field offensively, Georgia doing the same in the second half, Georgia blitzing on most plays against Milrow in the first half, um, just the aggressive nature by both coaches. And it's like, I watched that game and yeah, Ohio state can compete with those teams athletically. But the question is always, does Ohio state have the coaching 
ability to call a game that aggressive and be comfortable and letting, you know, let, you know, having faith in your players to make the plays rather than coaching scared. And both of those teams do not coach scared, man. They let it all hang out. And if they lose, they lose, but they will die trying before they lose a game. Whereas Ohio state is kind of the opposite. So that's what I take from that game initially coaching wise. So now schematically one thing that really sticks out and it's going to be a real big problem because we are Ohio state podcast first is Jalen Milrow is going to be really tough to stop. If Ohio state matches up with somebody like him, especially with a defense under Jim Knowles that doesn't really pressure the quarterback. He is somebody that is now able to throw the deep ball. And because of his already, his scrambling ability, that makes him that much more dangerous. Like we are looking at a very similar season for him as, as uh, Jaden. Oh man. The, the Redskins quarterback. Now what's his name? Um, you're muted, Michael. Did you hear me? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, Jaden Daniels. is Jaden Daniels. I keep mm-hmm. thinking he's Jaden Davis from Michigan. Mm-hmm. Like the first Jaden comes to mind is Jaden Davis. He's having a similar season to Jaden Daniels from the Redskins, former LSU quarterback last year, but he's on a more talented team, which is scary. What is really scary is Alabama has a better wide receiver than they did all of last season. And that Ryan Williams, true freshman, like goodness gracious, man, this kid is making some ridiculous catches has breakaway speed can stop on a dime change directions has great hands he's making catches over malachi starks from georgia like that that you know like malachi starks is arguably the best safety in the country and this kid is making catches over him and stopping on a dime making these alabama defenders miss um what i also see on the other side georgia we thought their offense was down but i think alabama's defense is pretty good and Georgia lit them up through the air. Like Alabama had a really hard time covering the deep throws. And yeah, Alabama had a hard time covering the deep throws against Georgia. Carson Beck is going to be a first round NFL quarterback. That doesn't mean they're going to have a hard time covering the deep throws against a team like Ohio State with Will Howard as their quarterback. Yeah, I believe Ohio State has much better receivers than Georgia, but what good are the receivers that the quarterback cannot get them the ball? So, you know. Those are things that stick out to me. I mean, the teams were pretty even, about as even can get. And, yeah, it was just an amazing game, and it really opened your eyes as an Ohio State fan of what could come down the road and how Ohio State could deal with them. Yeah, I mean, I I will say this, that uh, – you know, I, I a lot of the throws that Jalen Milrow made, I think that uh, I think that you know Howard could make. I mean, there there might there might have been one or two that he didn't, but I mean, a lot of the throws that he made, I think Howard could make. Uh, the question is, can they, you know, be able to run the ball the way that Alabama did? Because uh, Alabama certainly in that first half exploited some weaknesses in the Georgia defense and was really able to run the ball, and then. Uh, as they were running the ball, that opened up a lot of uh, intermediate passing game. Then they took a couple of deep shots. You know, they finished off with a, a touchdown down the sideline, which was a uh, you know about a twenty-five yard throw, so not a not a huge deal, but it was just put in a good place. And so, I mean, they certainly showed that there are some areas that you can pick on that Georgia defense. Now, the one thing Ohio State definitely does not have that Alabama had is they don't have a electric threat running the ball to worry about in Will Howard the way that they did with uh, Milrow. And so that certainly puts the defense a little bit more uh, on edge. Now, I am optimistic of what Chip Kelly could maybe do with this running game with the two running backs we have against that uh, defense that certainly showed some signs that you can run on them. Yeah, you're right. You can run on them with the quarterback, it looks like, because you're right. They did have some long runs, but those long runs were by Jalen Milbro. Jalen Milbro was a leading rusher in the game. He had 16 carries for 117 yards, 7.3 average. Justice Haynes, 
solid, but they didn't really use the running backs that much. That Justice Haynes had six carries. Jan Miller had five. Um, Jalen Milrow was really their offense, man. Jalen Milrow and Ryan Williams. Uh, there's a little, well, no, I can't say there was more balance by Georgia because, you know, they got down. Carson Beck. He didn't throw for a high percentage, but he threw for a lot of yards, 439 yards. Um, Arian Smith, we remember him, the long touchdown catch against Ohio State. You know, Lathan Ransom was on him, I think, one-on-one, -on -one, like a cover one or something in the, in the Peach Bowl. You know, we remember him from that. He's a speedster. So, you know, another thing that sticks out, I understand Milrow's elusive, but and we know how aggressive Georgia's defense is, but – they did not register one sack on Alabama. And I do believe Alabama probably does have the best offensive line in the country again. It's either them or Texas, but that just kind of shows right there. Like, you know, Alabama is going to be a force, man. They are a force right now. And they should be the number one ranked team in the country. And they are. They are, like, I think in the polls, that I, unless Texas is. I don't know. Uh, yeah, Texas could be. But, um, me yeah, look. I mean they're 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 a very good team, and uh, Georgia is as well. Honestly, uh, you know Alabama, I just believe scares me a little more than Georgia does. Uh, I would hate to lose to Georgia more than I would hate to lose to Alabama, even though I wouldn't want to lose to either one of them. But uh, I, Alabama scares me a little bit more. I just feel like they're a little oh, yeah. better overall team. Um. It's very close. It is very close between these two teams. But I think I agree with you just because Milrow is the X factor. Yeah, Carson Beck's going to be a better pro, but Milrow is what every college team wants as a quarterback if he can actually throw the deep ball, which he can. And now we were both right. Alabama's number one in the AP poll. Coaches poll. Texas is number one. But at the end of the day, the only poll that matters is the CFP poll, which comes out in a month, Michael, a month which yeah. is just crazy, man. We are like, I was just saying before, we were like a month into the season. You know, we need to enjoy every Saturday that we have as college football fans, because the season is short. It's very short, man. And you just, you know, um, yeah, yeah. The question is Jay, what was, what was Alabama doing to have Carson Beck so out of whack in the first half? I mean, I, I, I can't answer that because I've not, really sat and watched it but what i mean i know that at times they were bringing some serious blitzes on on certain downs but uh they certainly had him out of sorts you know he threw two picks early he he really threw a third pick and got bailed out by the db because the db dropped it there at the end of the first half or that would have been a, a pick six he would have walked into the end zone or at least very close to it but um yeah i mean alabama definitely had carson beck rattled i mean clearly he uh he fought back and, and found his uh, rhythm and got, you know, got things going, but it would be interesting to me what they were doing to have the level of success they did in the first half. Yeah. From a film standpoint, I can't mm -hmm. give you that answer, but from what, yeah. from what I could see, um, my cat's scratching at my door. Um, what I can tell you is uh, Alabama or Georgia in the second half started to, spread the field vertically. Like, yeah. I don't know. They, they found a way to find time for uh, Carson Beck and they started letting the ball go down the field, man. They started really challenging these Alabama defensive backs. I know Alabama was starting one true freshman uh, on one side and uh, man, it's crazy to think Alabama has two corners from like the state of California. That should not happen. Like that should not fucking happen. Come on, USC, recruit these guys, keep these guys home. UCLA, like these guys should not be going to Alabama anymore. So hopefully the Big Ten money changes that. But yeah, Alabama's just young in the secondary. Yeah, Caleb Downs isn't there anymore, but they're going to get better. Like that is not going to be a weakness for very long because I think Alabama's just a machine. Yeah, Caleb DeBoer is not Nick Saban, but he's still a very good coach. He's had success everywhere he's been. I have no doubt in my mind that he is going to improve that secondary. And not saying they're going to be a strength, but they're not going to be the weakness they were in this game. So, yeah, what the biggest thing that changed in the second half is Georgia really just let it all hang loose. They started blitzing pr pr probably every single play. Alabama, you know, got a little conservative. They got a little bit more conservative, and Georgia did not. Georgia just let it rip. 
They threw past the sticks like every play it, it felt like. And uh, yeah, they're just, you know, two super talented teams. And you're right. Alabama did scare me more. They are actually the number one team in the country in the 247 uh, composite, Michael. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I do know that, it, I mean, Beck also threw an interceptable ball in the second half, uh, threw into double coverage, and it could have been picked. would have been a good catch, but, you know, it was, it was knocked up, uh, you know, kind of knocked down. But, you know, one thing I noticed with Alabama – is that at times, of course, you can't do this all the time, but at times they were not scared to have five and six guys close to the line of scrimmage when Georgia was in these run heavy sets. And, you know, that is, uh, I mean, that's what the defensive coordinators are paid the big money for. I mean, obviously, that's a little bit of a risk if they pass, but, you know, again, when they're all bunched in like that, it's a lot easier to cover the pass. You know, you can bring more guys up to the line of scrimmage. And, that's something that uh, teams like the Buckeyes will have to do. You know, in these four two fives, you can't sit back with just six guys, uh, with just four guys on the line of scrimmage and two linebackers against these hammer run teams. You've got to, you know, uh, change your looks up and bring more guys up and send more guys to shoot the gaps and, and try and get that run game off track and get that uh, offense off schedule. You got to, man. You got to. And again, you just don't see, like, and, you know, we're going to factor in the Big Ten with this, but. You know, Michigan last year did it, but for the most part across the Big Ten versus these SEC teams, you just don't see defenses really trying to, I guess, be the aggressor. They're trying to be uh, too reactive, not proactive. Well, yeah. teams like this, they again, like that goes back to my point, they let it all hang loose. If you beat them over the top of passing, you beat them over the top of passing, but they'll be damned if you just bowl them over running the ball or – uh, beat them with like muscle and power up front. Like they're going to do, do their best to take away the run. They're going to do the bit, the best to try and get you off schedule, do anything to rattle you that they can. And that's just a mentality thing. It seems like these sec teams have over the big 10. They just, they play more aggressive. They play faster. And I guess that, you know, just, I mean, obviously they have a lot of talent too. And, you know, off topic, man, I know somebody mentioned in the last video, if they, preferred Ryan Williams or Jeremiah Smith. Michael, what do you think, man? The true freshman from Alabama, Ryan Williams, who had six catches for 177 yards and a touchdown, or Jeremiah Smith, who are you taking right now and why? Well, uh, I'm obviously probably a little bit biased, but I am going to take Jeremiah Smith uh, because as electric as the other kid is, he's a fantastic player. I mean, take your pick, either one, and you've got difference maker, uh, type players, but you know, I would take Smith because he doesn't have the slipperiness that uh, you know the the kid from Bama has. He's got that kind of uh, a little bit of that Jamar Chase slipperiness that he can just kind of like appear in little windows and catch balls that you're like, holy crap, how did he catch that? Um, but you know, Smith has got uh, you know as as I have said and as he's displayed, he's got that big range. Uh, you know, he can go up and, and get balls that the kid from Alabama cannot. And so I'll take that in a big game uh, versus what the kid from Bama has. But uh, they're both fantastic players. It's crazy to think, man, when I look at uh, oh, uh, Ryan Williams from Alabama, you know, he kind of reminds me of is Garrett Wilson, but he, a more talented version of Garrett Wilson, which is scary. Yeah, just like you know, we know how great Garrett Wilson was, you know, top fifteen NFL draft pick, but Ryan Williams looks like the same exact player, but faster, and you know, same exact size and everything. But I think he's a little faster, and he might be have a little bit better ball skills. So, um, yeah. if I were to pick, oh boy, because Ryan Williams is seventeen years old now. Yeah. Jeremiah Smith's 18 years old. Like he actually reclassified and came in a year early. Like all these kids, I saw some st statistic about kids coming in early. Sonny Styles, Sonny Alex Styles, like, hey, you know, people really struggling coming into college a year early. This kid is the exception. He is not the rule. So, man, it is like flip a coin, whatever. I, you know, I might, my heart says Jeremiah because I'm an Ohio State fan. My head says Ryan Williams because, you know, He's 
younger and has more potential to physically mature. So, dude, I might say Ryan Williams, man, just for that reason. Yeah, he's not as tall as Jeremiah Smith, but he's a little faster, and I think he might have better leaping ability. So I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, but, you know, bo- both uh, both great players, uh, you know, I, th- I think – they'll both probably mature and develop over the next uh, couple of years and, you know, both be a lot of, a lot of fun to watch and would be nice to see them uh, maybe meet up in multiple national championship games in their career. That would be pretty cool. That would uh, be pretty cool if Ohio state actually wins. Yeah. Exa- well, yeah. I mean, Hey, I would be, <laughs> I, I'd, I'd take one, I'd take one and one against Bama and the national title over the next three years. I mean, if you told me next three years, Ohio state's going to go two national championships, play Bama both times and be one and one. I'd say, yeah, I'll take that. I mean, uh, you yeah, know, I would take I, that. I, I would yeah, take it. yeah. So Michael moving this along a little bit, um, the state of college football now, I mean, I see the rankings in front of me here. Um, uh, Man, oh, man, it's just all the best teams in college football this year outside of maybe one, two max are in the SEC, man. They're all in the SEC. I don't think there's one – there's not one team from the Big 12 who's a true title contender. Utah got exposed the other night I saw on the road – or actually at home against Arizona. Kansas State, you know, I like Kansas State. I like their quarterback. They're not – They're not a true title contender. I know people are trying to uh, mention BYU, but let's be real. BYU played one of the top five SEC teams on a neutral field. I think they're going to get run off the field. I mean, they really struggled with Arkansas like a year or two ago, and um, they have the same talent then as they do now. So, yeah, man. So, like, looking at the landscape, man, I mean, it's just – it's an unfortunate fact, and this is why we keep beating that drum. The Big Ten needs to get better. But, you know, outside of one or two teams, man, the best teams are all in the SEC. I'm looking at it right now. Well, yeah. I mean, the and, you know, we see this every year to a degree uh, where it's just the, the absurd SEC stacking. Um, I'm not saying that they don't deserve it to a large degree and that they don't uh, – uh, that maybe that's not the right call for this time of year. Um, but, you know, it, it does happen every year. You know, early in the year, um, there's all kinds of SEC teams up in the front. And, you know, many of them end up not being what they are, you know, the first part of the season. Uh, they end up kind of falling back. But because all of the teams got ranked, they're always beating and getting beaten by ranked teams. You know, and so some of these wins against these eight and four teams seem more impressive on the resume because that team's ranked 19th in the country or whatever, or 21st in the country because, you know, they, they got ranked high early. They lost to four games, you know, three of them were to other ranked teams. And, you know, so they stay in the rankings. Uh, and so there's a little bit of uh, a gamesmanship. I think that the SEC has mastered with that, but that being said, um, it, it has been the strongest conference, uh, the last, you know, going back to about 2006 really is when you can say there was a definitive turn and it became, uh, without a doubt over the next, uh, many years, the strongest conference in, uh, in football. Yeah, you're right, man. Um, I just want to correct myself real quick. BYU actually beat Arkansas last year. It was two years ago they got blown out at home or lost decisively. Last year they actually went into Arkansas and won, so more power to them. But I can tell you right now, Arkansas is not one of the top five teams in the SEC, and that's really what I'm referencing. Like, you know, right. BYU would not be able to stand and punch, at least with the top four. Maybe the fifth best team in the SEC, maybe, but definitely top four they wouldn't. Uh, and And to your point about 2006 when it started to change, yes, Ohio State had – a lot to do with that. A lot to do with that. But yep. at the same time, the you know the Big Ten, I believe, were was two and zero heading into the national championship game with Ohio State and Florida. I believe Wisconsin and another team I don't remember in two thousand six actually won the bowl games against the SEC. So yeah, I mean, like the Big Ten is more than any conference held their own. I know there are times like back when you know Oklahoma and Texas were you know holding their own and you know the big 12 had all those fantastic offenses and stuff but the big 10 is 
I will say actually not the Big 12. I would say the ACC. The ACC is really the conference that hung with the SEC for longer periods of time, up until well, pri- really primar- the last four years. Yeah, primarily just Clemson. Um, Florida I mean, State won the first. Uh, Florida, the BCS, Florida State, the last yeah, BCS Florida State did one. So the ACC is unique in that, in that they had two teams that could win a national championship, but the conference was basically garbage. Um, it, you know, it's not been a very good conference. Uh, it's still not a good conference. Uh, the Big Ten's far better than the ACC, uh, but it, um, it, it did have two teams that were able to win a national championship in the modern era, which the Big Ten has now as well. Um, and so currently, uh, you know, the SEC has nine teams in the top 25, number one, number two, number four, number five, nine, 12, 13, 19, and a tied for 25th. The Big Ten is uh, very squarely in second place with seven, number three, number six, number seven, number 10, number 11, number 23, number 24. After that, it falls down to the Big Ten, the Big 12 with four, the ACC with three, the Mountain West with two, and then one independent Notre Dame ranked uh, number 14. So, um, you know, while uh, we, you know, while we we want there to be a year, because I think there should be years, I'm not saying every year the Big Ten has to be better than the SEC, but there should be a year now and then where the big 10 is just better than the sec. And I think we're headed that way. I think we're making steps towards it being that way. We're not there yet, uh, but I think we're making steps towards it. And so to have what uh, you and I both consider to be a down year in the big 10, the reason we consider it that is because Michigan is uh, you know, they lost a slew of seniors uh, and they're kind of in a, a rebuild phase somewhat. And same thing with Washington, um, and so, uh, you know, there could be years where the Big Ten's rising a little higher than it is. But even at that, to have seven teams in the top 25, uh, I mean, that was, you know, 10 years ago, uh, f- 15 years ago, a bad year in the Big Ten. You had uh, three teams in the top 25. So, you know, we've come a long way uh, in, in, in closing the gap between the SEC during the dark years from about 2006 to uh, – uh, to really about 2014. Uh, and then, you know, pretty much domination, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, uh, Michigan stopping the freight train in 2023. So uh, it's a formidable force, but the Big Ten's making progress, Jay. And so I am, I am pleased with that. I am pleased we are not going backward uh, the way that we seem to for several years uh, back some years ago. Now I would say the the SEC would be miles ahead, but you know, Ole Miss actually lost at home to Kentucky this past weekend, and I don't yeah. think Kentucky they're world beaters or anything. But that is pretty amazing by Kentucky and Mark Stoops, by the way, for them to take Georgia all the way to the wire, and then literally come back the next week, go to Ole Miss and win. And I, in my opinion, I thought Ole Miss was a legitimate top five team. I could not have been more wrong. Not saying they're not a top 10 team still. I do believe they are. But it just shows you the strength of the SEC, man. Um, the You know, Kentucky, Wildcats, like Mark Stoops, man. I'm telling you, Mark Stoops, Ryan Day gets fired this year, man. I'm all aboard that Mark Stoops train, Michael. Mark Stoops is similar to Urban. He's like Urban Light in a way. Coach in the yeah. SEC had success, had big wins at Kentucky, Ohio guy. I mean, it's the same exact story with Urban. It's just that he didn't win any titles, and he's coaching at a much lesser program. If he's coaching at Florida, does he win any national championships? We we don't know, but uh, you know we we know this. Um, you know, the, and the the downside to a guy like Stoops is, uh, you know, some people say, well, some guys are just great at the mid level. You know, they, they can take a, a, a low level program and they can get them to mid level, but they're not ready for the upper level. And, and I don't know about Mark Stoops. I don't know the answer to that, but I can say this, what he's done there has been very impressive. And uh, what he's done there, even just in this short part of the year has been impressive because um, in most years, not this year, I wouldn't give Ryan Day, uh, you know, an out this year, but in most years, if you said uh, Ohio State went to the playoffs and in round one we played Ole Miss and beat them, and in round two we played Georgia in the semifinal and went down to the wire and got beat by a point, you would be like, "Well, that's a you know that's a respectable showing. You know, you you got one big win and almost got another one." And this is for Ohio State, and so this is uh, very impressive what what Stoops uh, did at Kentucky uh, against those two programs. 
No, I couldn't agree more, man. I couldn't agree more. Mark Stoops is a great coach, and I will tell anyone I believe he's a better coach than Ryan Day. Ryan Day doesn't have the success at Kentucky that this guy is having. And I do believe if Ryan Day is gone, that's the first call I make if I'm Ross Bjork. Um, but anywho, let's not try and be too negative here because we're trying to be hopeful. Uh, Michael, yeah, I'm looking. You're gonna yeah, want. Go you're ahead. gonna want. You're gonna want Ryan Day after he hoists the trophy this year. In yeah, the middle that's of, right. In the middle of the yes. field, you're gonna you're gonna want Ryan Day. You're gonna be yeah, glad. Um, and so, gonna... Michael, I'm gonna put you on the spot, man. Mm -hmm. So you just went through the rankings, right? You took a look at them. Yeah. I want you to pull them back up, mm -hmm. and I want you to tell me your top five or six teams. I want you to rank them for me right now. I'll rank them too. And this is literally on the fly. I didn't do any prep for this, but based on everything you've seen, every team you've watched, can you rank your top five or six teams right now? Yeah, I can. In order or in descending order, whatever. I can. And my order, uh, I, I can tell you, is going to be a little bit different than yours. But my order is right now Alabama one, Ohio State two. Georgia three, Texas four. So you're just going to, you're giving your top four then. Yeah, okay. Well, you want me to go beyond that? Uh, you know, after that, I am going to go Oregon, Tennessee. I believe Oregon could compete with Tennessee. I, I believe Oregon could beat Tennessee. I believe if Tennessee went to Eugene, they very well could lose. I think Tennessee's a good team. I don't think they're a world beater team. Uh, I think they're around the level of an Oregon. Uh, I think it's about a toss up between the two. Well, if you put Oregon ahead of Texas, you would believe they would beat them, not could beat them, right? Uh, uh, ahead of Tennessee? Yeah. Oh, I, yeah, Tennessee. I'm sorry. Yeah, of Tennessee. Yeah, you yeah. put them ahead. You put them at five and Tennessee at six, right? Yeah, I mean, that's interchangeable. One or the other. Oregon at five, Tennessee at six, or vice versa. Those, those are my top six. Okay. So I'm looking at this list right now. And I will go Tennessee six, Oregon five, Texas four, Ohio State three, Georgia two, Alabama one. So really just this little bit of a difference between us. I have... Yeah. Alabama and Georgia ahead because those coaches have won. Well, the board hasn't, but I mean, Alabama program is still like a machine The you know, I've just seen more from those teams on a, in a big game scale. Um, things could change in a week and a half when Ohio state visits Eugene, but let's not look too far ahead. Iowa is kind of solid, but my biggest reason why I put Ohio state above Texas, Michael is Michigan has been kind of exposed for like being a terrible team. I thought like even inserting Alex Orgy as their starting quarterback would fix things some. Michael, they Minnesota could have won that game. They actually the 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 Big Ten crew that was announcing that game. Yeah. Basically, I guess they came out and I I didn't read it or anything, but apparently they came out and apologized for missing that onside kick that Minnesota did not go offsides on. So Minnesota, we know that they suck. They fucking suck. Yeah. DJ Fleck needs fired. You know, they got beat bad by Iowa. They lost at home to North Carolina. But yet here they are going on the road to Michigan. Michigan yeah. got beat pretty bad at home by Texas, but they also started Davis Warren in that game. I've said it. If they don't start Davis Warren and they start Alex Orgy and don't turn the ball over like five fucking times, they don't mm -hmm. get blown out. They probably still lose decisively, but they don't get blown out. Yep. But here is Minnesota going on the road and giving Michigan all they want and then some. And I'm supposed to think, like, that's a great win for Texas now? Texas just struggled at home against Mississippi State, a Mississippi State team that got blown out at home by Toledo. So I understand, like, you don't want to use the deductive logic there and everything, but right. it's just – it, well, the, you, know, you know, there's no merit to that. Yeah. Well, I mean, we can certainly get uh, badly burned, you know, using transitive properties uh, in college football or football in general. But, you know, that being said, I, I just think that there is evidence that Texas is uh, 
you know, is you know, needs to be around number four, not number one, two, or three. Uh, time will tell. They'll decide it on the field, but that's uh, you know, that's where I'm at. That's where I'm at with it now. Yeah, me too, man. Texas is a very good team. I just don't think they're. I think Ohio State's better than them. And I, you know, do I think Texas can, you know, will beat Georgia at home here in a couple of weeks? I think, you know, I have to look a little bit more. I think they still can. And mm-hmm. maybe if I were a betting man, I would bet on Texas, but on a neutral mm-hmm. field, I'm taking Georgia decisively. But I yeah. think in Texas, it's going to be a hell of a game. Um, I do wonder about uh, Arch Manning starting over Quinn Ewers. I mean, I remember seeing Arch Manning in high school, not being all that impressed with him, but he has impressed me as a Texas quarterback so far. And he looks more talented than Quinn Ewers. Like, honestly, Quinn, Quinn Ewers is, uh, I don't know. Guys, guys had an interesting career. Um, had a lot of injuries, missed a lot of games and, you know, kind of mucked things up with uh, his reclassification. So I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen to Quinn Ewers. He could go down as one of the greatest overrated guys ever. Uh, being rated a hundred, you know, almost like a can't miss first rounder, you know, top pick of the draft, top five pick of the draft. That's what he was billed as. Um, and it hasn't been that really definitively so far. Uh, but you know, he is, I do think he's talented. So, I mean, he could, uh, come out and get it together and, and, uh, show that he is that, but it's certainly looking more and more like a real possibility that, um, you know, he was just overranked out of high school. Yeah, I think he was overranked. I think he's a solid quarterback. I pointed it out a few times that, you know, he lacks arm strength and everything, but um, he's got nice decision making. He's got good maneuverability in the pocket. He seems to use that well. But yeah, again, like he's not the runner that Arch Manning is. I can tell you he doesn't throw the deep ball that Arch Manning does either. Arch Manning's got a nice little deep ball there. So they definitely have a quarterback. Um, issue on there well i don't know if it's an issue but a discussion there is a Mm -hmm. quarterback discussion that is going on in austin texas right now well michael real quick man i mean you know just to touch on the big 10 you know the game that sticks out to me this week uh and we're gonna know a lot about oregon in preparation for our game because michael do you know whom oregon plays on friday night who they play michigan state Mm. They play Michigan State on Friday night. So now we're going to have a team that we will have both played. And Oregon's at home, but we are going to learn a lot about them. And it would not surprise me, Michael, if Michigan State hangs around with them for a while. Yeah. I really yeah. do believe they can. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do too. Um, I'm uh, sorry, Sparty fans. Uh, I am rooting for Oregon because I want an undefeated matchup in Eugene. Uh, between the Buckeyes and and Oregon, but uh, yeah, I do think Michigan State could uh, make a little noise in that game. I think they could be a tough kind of obstinate opponent that uh, would hang into it deep in the game. I think ultimately Oregon is going to win, uh, but it'll be interesting to watch. Yeah, well, Michigan State's going to have to score some points because there's one thing that Oregon can do that Ohio State can't do, and they can throw the vertical pass of Dylan Gabriel, which is so interesting. They can do that because Dylan Gabriel's like a little munchkin out there. I think he's only like six feet tall, but he does throw a nice, a nice deep ball, much better than Will Howard. And Oregon's got some speedy receivers and Michigan state's not very good in the secondary. They're not as terrible as they used to be, but they're still not good. What are you going to do the first time? Will Howard drops a dime on a 35 yard throw vertical downfield and we score a touchdown. I'll believe it when I see it. We've tried a couple times. Remember the throw <laughs> against Western Michigan that he severely underthrowed, and then he underthrew one against Akron. Again, I'm not saying, you know, th- I would be like, okay, what do we need to do to get national championship tickets? But, you know, then you have to believe that Knowles is going to bring pressure and stuff. They did in the second half against Michigan State. But, um, yeah, I mean, I would be a st- a- ecstatic, man. I would I'd probably call you on the phone right away and just – tears of joy i don't fucking know yeah well we might see it jay we might see it against iowa uh we you know it's i I think it's coming that we're gonna i don't know iowa plays uh you know they kind of again like we talked about they play a soft zone but they run that soft zone to perfection man well that's true and so it's gonna get behind them and they don't really have to so it's it's not really that big a deal in that in that case um but you know uh I'm not of the opinion that Will Howard can't throw a deep ball. I'm of the opinion that um, 
he doesn't throw the best deep ball that you're going to find. It's not his forte. However, uh, Zach Smith did report on his podcast last week that throws over 20 yards. Will Howard is among the top in the nation in accuracy. He's also among, among the lowest in attempts as well, I think I saw. Probably so. Like but... Zach Smith was ripping. I think I remember listening to that. Zach Smith is ripping on Will Howard for just not being able to throw the deep ball. Yeah, but I'm just saying, you know, he has been he you know, he does have success with that 15 to 20 yard throw and that does stretch the field some. It's not like it's not like uh defenses can just fall asleep on that and uh as you start to soften that up, some things can open up uh, over top. So I don't think the deep ball's hopeless for Will Howard and the Buckeyes. I'm not as down as Jay on Will's deep ball, but I I, I don't think that that is, uh, you know, something that he is excels at. We'll put it that way. Yeah, two other games here that stick out, Michael. Um, Michigan actually goes on the road to Washington. That is going to – I don't know if that game's on NBC or Peacock. I see it listed like – I see NBC slash Peacock, so I'm going to assume that just means Peacock, and that sucks for you guys because, you know, uh, those are uh, – that's a game that should be on national television. I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, I expect Washington to win that game decisively. Michigan's no good. Washington is really not very good either. And it's a battle of two teams for, you know, like the national championship last year with completely different rosters, completely different coaching staffs. They are a shell of what they were last year. And that's a shame, but you know, you just got to recruit, man. You got to be able to recruit. You got to be able to hire great coaches and just keep the machine rolling. Alabama did Georgia. Well, I don't want to say Georgia did, but they upgraded from Mark Rick to Kirby Smart. And then the next game is, do you know where college game day is this week, man? I have no idea. No You're idea. Going I... to Berkeley, California for Cal. Oh, my gosh. Are you serious? Yeah, I'm dead serious. Dude, that was the same exact what? reaction that a lot of people had, man. Yeah, they're going Berkeley, out to Berkeley, California? California. Yeah, with all those tree-hugging hippies. Jeez. Now, I, I will what... say this. That's interesting to be college game day out there. They're three hours behind us, and they're going to be broadcasting out there, which is essentially 6 a.m. in the morning time in California. And it's just like, damn, man, like fucking hell. You got to be like hardcore fan to go out there. But again, it could just be one of those crazy drug addicts that just freaking stumbles upon it because we know the homeless population in California is out I... of fucking control. I imagine they'll get people there. I'd be surprised if they don't, but it's a, that's an odd place to go for college game day. Yeah, and Cal's not even all that good. They are just not even all that good of a team. I, it's no, just like, I mean, they, in they, Miami, did, they went know. in and didn't they go in and beat Auburn on their home field? Yeah, but Auburn's not very good. They're athletic, no, but they're not very good. No, they're not good at all. I'm just saying, like, I mean, Cal's not terrible, but no, they're not very good. Uh, who are they playing? They're playing Miami. Miami is there at home. Okay. Or Miami is the road team coming in. Okay. Well, you know, I mean, that's kind of a cool game, I guess. You know, Miami, they're ranked high or whatever. And, uh, uh, you know, you got California the first time that they have played, uh, you know, as conference foes. So I guess I get it. But, yeah, not a not a prime location for college. Well, I think they were at Texas A&M in week one. The only game that comes to mind they could have gone to other than that is Texas A&M, Missouri, Texas A&M is at home, but they've already been there this year. So I guess from a pragmatic standpoint, it does make sense. But I mean, if Oregon and well, no college game day is going to be at Oregon next week. Let's be real. So, you know, does the location suck? Yes. But at the, also the fact of the matter is it's not like they had a lot of options here. No, no, they didn't. Um, but yeah, I think that wraps up the, uh, yeah, that wraps the, it up, the rundown. Uh, thank you guys for watching and we'll be back, uh, with another episode next Monday. See you then.